All right, hi everyone. This is the recording for the chapter 18 lecture, which is focused on um, obstructive lung disorders, okay? All right, so we'll talk about just some char common characteristics of obstructive lung disorders in general um, and some of the concepts, and then we'll talk about some specific obstructive lung disorders. Okay, so what types of disorders are obstructive lung disorders. Disorders like asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, cystic fibrosis, and bronchi bronchiectasis, okay? Um, so we will talk specifically about these as we move through um, this lecture. In terms of key terms, a term we've heard about, right, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's actually an umbrella term for um, progressive lung disorders that, um, often comprise or are composed of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And all of these obstructive lung disorders are characterized by the symptom of dyspnea, which we already have talked about several times throughout the semester. Okay, so some concepts that are related to these disorders. Um, obstructive lung disorders will impair oxygenation and perfusion right? So it's going to impair the, basically the movement of oxygen from the lungs into the blood, right? And if there is no oxygen getting into the blood, um, you know, obviously this is going to affect the amount of oxygen that then can get to other tissues of the body. Um, there is an increased work of breathing associated with these disorders. And we talked about this when we talked about the restrictive lung disorders as well. And this will then lead to an increase in metabolic demand, right? And an increased expenditure of energy um, just to be able to breathe, um, which then um, lessens the amount of energy that is available for other um, functions, right? Okay, so same figure that we see in every chapter. Um, just to look at some of the concepts is, concepts that are related, um, I did add in, and again, a reminder, well, two reminders here as we start. Review sheet should be out. You should be taking notes on that review sheet, right? Second reminder is that always check the notes. I did, there are a couple slides where I did add some notes in here, whether it's a definition or a clarification, okay? So he, on here, if you look, it says costro, costochondral pain. So that's referring to, oh, look, I have a little typo there. That's referring to um, the cartilage that connects the upper ribs to the sternum. So obviously, you can imagine if you're coughing a lot, you can end up having pain there. Also, abdominal pain, muscle pain, right, because of that um, increased coughing and the effort of, of coughing and trying to get this mucus out. Okay, so again, take a look at some of these um, concepts that are related. Um, in the middle here, we have oxygenation, and all of these are really um, characteristics of what we're going to talk about and the diseases we're going to talk about in this chapter. Okay, so let's um, talk a little bit more about some alterations in anatomic airway structure, right, and function that, again, is characteristics of sort of all of these obstructive lung disorders, okay? Um, so one of the things that's going to happen in obstructive lung disorders is that really the airway obstruction is going to become worse during exhalation, okay? Um, so so here, um, I, oh, I don't know why I kind of put that. I guess, it, anyway, I guess I should have a bullet point here. Yeah, one second. Let me just fix that because that's annoying me. Um, there's just missing a bullet point. That's why it looks weird. Um, so, so the idea, again, is that there actually is going to be... I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is going to be especially worse during exhalation. Okay, so that's what I have here, especially difficult. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about why. Um, they are characterized by inflammation. Okay, so inflammation is a main con major contributor to these diseases. Um, you end up also with loss of support for small airways. Okay, bronchoconstriction and also mucus in the airways. Again, that is triggered by... Um, by inflammation. So the inflammation leads to the mucus accumulation or sort of causes it, but then also the mucus inflama mucus accumulation then leads to even more inflammation. Okay, so we're going to talk about this, but these are all things that are basically characteristic of all of these ob obstructive diseases in this chapter. So if we talk about um, bronchoconstriction up here, well, what do we mean by that and how does that involve the smooth muscles, right? So remember, those airways are lined with a layer of smooth muscle. Remember, pretty much all of your organs um, 
maybe not every single one. We think about the heart you know, not smooth muscle, there's cardiac muscle, but for mo most of the, you know, GI tract and your respiratory structures, um, those airways are lined with a layer of smooth muscle, okay? And remember that that smooth muscle is, you know, involuntary muscle, okay? And in terms of the airways, if that smooth muscle contracts, it causes constriction of the airways, right? Or bronchoconstriction. And that will narrow those airways. And this is actually due to parasymp parasympathetic stimulation, okay? And so that's sort of normally, right? So there's a normal sort of process where you have, um, you know, neuro sort of um, innervation that will lead to constriction or dilation or constriction or relaxation of these smooth muscles, okay? So if the muscles are contracted, it will lead to narrowing those airways, okay? Um, again, inflammation is going to further lead to more constriction, okay? So again, normally these muscles should be able to constrict and relax. However, if you have excess amount of contraction, right, and more inflammation there, it's going to lead to more constriction, okay, which is obviously a problem. The airway is narrower, not as much air can get in there, okay? Um, if you want to think about bronchodilation, again, this is when those smooth muscles are relaxed, okay, and those airways would be widened. And this is actually due to sympathetic activation, okay? So norepinephrine, epinephrine will bind specifically to these beta-2 adrenergic receptors, Right. And so if we think about taking a bronchodilator, right, or an inhaler, it's going to it's going to target these receptors to cause the smooth muscles to relax and widen those airways. OK. And that's how those work. Um, again, airway obstruction decreases the airway diameter. Right. And this is what I was just saying. OK. You're going to have resistance to airflow. And then you're also, as a result, going to have a slower speed of exhalation. OK. It's harder to exhale that air out. So normally, if you think about the ratio between inspiration, right, inhaling versus expiration, exhaling, it normally takes two times longer to exhale, okay? In obstructive lung disease, it can take as, as much as five times longer to exhale, okay? And so if we take a look here about, you know, looking at this airflow obstruction, right? Because again, we're talking about obstructive lung disorders. All of them have airflow obstruction, okay? So, and and here are some things that are happening in COPD, and we'll talk more about this. But, but and this is going to, again, most of these things are happening. Well, some of these things are happening in all of these obstructive lung disorders. So here it's saying obstruction by mucus, right? So without even having the smooth muscle contracted, you still can have obstruction due to increased production of mucus, okay? And it's also showing you that the alveoli are intact here. Here now, if we look at this bronchus, right, you can see now there's a much thicker um, smooth muscle wall and there's some damage to alveoli, okay? So this can also lead to obviously to obstruction, okay? So <clears throat> not only um, do the constriction of those smooth muscles lead to obstruction, but what also happens in these diseases is that you actually get more muscle, okay? So those cells will increase in size and increase in number and actually thicken that wall. That So obviously now you just normally have this narrower space, okay? What this is now also showing you here is that you have heavily damaged alveoli at this point, okay? And so this is something that happens in advanced stages of COPD. Obviously, this is going to interfere with um, the uh, basically being able to get oxygen into the blood, okay? So again, this sort of constant damage that's now happening to the smooth muscle and to the bronchi here ultimately then leads to damage of the alveoli as well. And you can actually see there's pretty much damage to the wall of the bronchus as well, okay? So all of these are gonna kind of contribute to um, airflow obstruction. This is particularly showing you um, what's happening and some of the things that happen in COPD. And we'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later on in the lecture as well. Okay, so as I said, this airway obstruction will negatively affect the speed, right? And the volume of airflow during exhalation particularly, okay? Um, and so I believe I talk a little bit more about kind of why that happens. Let me just see something. Um... Well, anyway, I'll kind of explain that now, I guess. The reason why you, you see this kind of during exhalation is that, you know, during inhalation, right, there's air in there. There's, so it's basically kind of holding those airways open. But what happens is with this sort of chronic damage that's going to end up occurring due to the inflammation, 
um, and the damage to sort of the surrounding structures that help support the airways, once the air is trying to come out of that or that air is out of the um, those airways, it causes those airways to kind of rapidly close and sort of lose their elasticity. And so that's why exhalation is um, m more difficult. OK, like I said, if you kind of just think about it, normally, if you're inhaling, you're sort of expanding those airways just because of the inhale. But on the exhale, you don't have that. Right. You're you're you want you want those airways to remain open to some degree. And because of the damage that occurs in these diseases, those airways close. OK. And so that's why it's particularly hard to exhale. OK. So anyway, I wanted to make sure I say that. And there may be a slide where I kind of um, say that again and I, I won't elaborate on it that much more. Okay, um, in terms of tests, right, how do we test for um, the speed and the volume of airflow? Okay, so they, we call these pulmonary function tests, and there are um, a few of them that are used routinely. Um, and again, they're used to assess obstructive lung disorders. So some of the types of these tests are spirometry, and that will basically measure airflow through the mouth and kind of measure maximal inhalation and exhalation. Okay, there's something called body plasmithography, if I could say it right, that will actually measure the total volume of air in the lungs, right, or the total lung capacity. And so all of these types of measurements are going to be important in diagnosing obstructive lung disease. Um, there's also something um, called nitrogen washout, where you can, it's an alternate method for um, the body ple pleth ismography. Okay, and so um, basically, again, same thing, it's going to be able to um, give the clinician the ability to measure total lung capacity, okay? So now, you know, again, here's a part of, of the lecture where we're not, I'm not really concerned about you guys memorizing any of this, but I wanted to give you guys an example of some of these measurements and what they mean, right? So we don't need to memorize this, all right? But let's be familiar with this. So some of the measurements that will be taken from these pulmonary tests are listed here, right? Tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume or IRV, right? IC, ERV. Sometimes you actually do this as a lab in anatomy and physiology, right? You can actually use a spirometer and, and you guys can blow into it and get some of these measurements. All right, so anyway, the definition is here. So just be familiar, again, not to memorize. Um, so if you're talking about tidal volume, volume of air inhaled and exhaled during one cycle of normal quiet breathing, right? Then if you're talking about IRV, this is the maximum volume of air that can be inhaled after this normal inhalation, okay? So, oh, sorry, that's the um, IC, right? Maximum volume of air that can be inhaled after normal, oh, this is, sorry, after normal exhalation, okay? So this is after normal inhalation. So anyway, there are all these different measurements here. And basically, you know, if, we, if you look at these in graphical form, I think it kind of helps you understand what's going on, right? You can talk about total lung capacity, okay? You can talk about vital capacity here, right? Inspiratory capacity, um, functional residual, residual capacity, right? We just talked about this I, ERV, tidal volume. Okay, these are all graphed here. So tidal volume, right? This is normal inhalation and exhalation, okay? Inspir inspiratory reserve volume, if you go back and you look to see what that is, remember this is the maximal volume of air that can be inhaled after you've already inhaled normally, right? So you inhale normally, but then you can inhale really deeply, right? And so you can measure what that volume is, okay? And then it's kind of similar with the expiratory reserve volume. So after that normal exhale, how much more air can come out of those lungs? Can you get out of those lungs? Okay. And then you always have a certain amount of residual volume that remains in the lungs. Okay. So again, these are all measurements that can be assessed in these obstructive lung disorders to, to see what the severity of the disease is. Okay. So let's specifically talk about asthma. Okay, so um, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways, right? Again, all of these um, obstructive lung disorders involve inflammation, okay? Um, you're going to end up with recurrent episodes of reversible airway obstruction and hyperreactive, right, airways. So meaning, you know, it's reversible, right? You're going to have an episode and then things sort of go back to normal, okay? Okay. Um, and so we do see a much higher incidence of asthma in industrialized countries, okay? If you talk about that asthma episode, right, what's happening during it, and I'll show you a figure on that in a, in a few slides, but basically there's inflammation that's going to occur, and 
um, production of mucus and things like that, that will cause wheezing, breathlessness, right? Chest tightness and cough. And a lot of times you'll, um, these will happen more often in the evening and also in the early morning. Um, some of the immune cells that are involved, eosinophils and T lymphocytes in this, in that sort of um, asthma, um, in asthma in general, really. Okay, and we'll talk more, a little bit more specifically about kind of what goes on um, and some more about the inflammation, okay? Risk factor, there is a genetic predisposition. Um, history, meaning if you have um, a history of lung um, issues, potentially then it puts you at higher risk for um, for asthma. Also, particular viral types of infections can put you at higher risk. In terms of gender, there's a gender component. Um, so apparently there's a little bit of a difference in terms of females. If, if, if that um, asthma is diagnosed after adolescence, it would have more of a tendency to persist into it persist into adulthood. For males, if it's diagnosed before puberty, then you have this increased um, risk for it to persist, persist into adulthood, okay? Obesity is a contributing factor. Um, exposure to allergens, irritants, and tobacco smoke also will um, induce asthma, okay? Um, again, in terms of kind of what exactly causes it, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, there is a genetic predisposition, as I mentioned, but there is often a trigger that is necessary to induce that asthma attack or that asthma episode, okay? In terms of classifying asthma, right, you can classify it based on clinical presentation in terms of those um, symptoms that are occurring, okay? Also, you can classify it based on what are the triggers or those precipitating factors that induce the symptoms, okay? Um, one of the main things that happens or, or types of um, asthma is allergic asthma, okay? So you can kind of categorize it as either allergic or non-allergic. So if you're talking about allergic asthma, it, it is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, okay? In non-allergic asthma, it's not a true allergic reaction, right? But it still involves an inflammatory response, okay? Um, <clears throat> In terms of, again, triggers or precipitating factors, there are, there are many. Um, and there's a table in the next slide that will categorize these. So, or that will show these. So it's basically categorized by allergies, infections, exercise, and medications. So depending on the patient and on the type of asthma they have, it will be triggered by different factors. Okay. Um, and so you can see here's some examples here, right? So again, allergens, occupational stimuli, infection, exercise, medication, air pollution. These are all precipitating factors. And then a little bit of more of a description here. So again, if you're talking about it being precipitated by an allergen, this is going to be that allergic asthma, okay? So some of these allergens that will precipitate that are listed here. Um, occupational stimuli, meaning these are the, the asthma is only um, precipitated by the exposure to occupational uh, stimuli. So when the individual is not at work, they're not having these symptoms, okay? Infection, right? There are infection that can cause this as well. Exercise, right? There is exercise-induced asthma. So basically, we can, we can categorize the type of asthma based on what types of factors will precipitate that asthma episode. Okay, so if we talk about what's happening during an acute episode of asthma, or we call an asthma attack, right, here's a little sort of flow chart that kind of shows what's going on. Again, there is almost always some sort of stimulus or trigger to that asthma attack, whether it be an allergen, whether it be an occupational exposure, whether it's tobacco smoke, right, whether it's exercise, whatever that happens to be. That stimulus then causes a, some chemical mediators to be released, right? when we think about these sort of immune chemical mediators, right? Which, again, then will activate a whole bunch of immune cells. The chemical mediators and the immune cells will then lead to changes in the bronchi, right? So it says bronchospasm, okay? So those smooth, that smooth muscle that lines those bronchioles will start to spas spasm or contract, okay? This then increases airway resistance, leads to obstruction, and, air and limits the amount of airflow, okay? And that's what causes the attack. If you again look more specifically kind of at those inflammatory cells that are activated, it then can lead to, you know, more, I guess, kind of permanent or other effects as well, like damage to the epithelial cells that line the, um, that line the, uh, the respiratory airways, right? Um, edema, 
increased mucus production. All of these things, again, that are triggered by inflammation, right, and, and various immune cells being activated also do these same things here, okay? So I would say this is definitely a figure that we should um, be familiar with and sort of be able to explain what's going on. Okay, so again, if we talk about the types, right, I said we can talk about allergic asthma, um, or non-allergic and kind of recurrent asthma, okay? So one of the reasons why I thought it was important to just go through a little bit more detail in terms of what's going on um, in asthma in general. And you will see in recurrent asthma, um, you know, you do see still some of these same inflammatory processes going on. So I don't want you to think that like what's happening here in allergic asthma is only happening um, in allergic asthma, a lot of this sort of extra inflammatory action that's occurring is also going to occur in really any type of asthma. Okay. But again, um, if you're going to call it allergic asthma, it's this type one hypersensitivity response, right? That is characterized as an allergic response. However, there are a whole bunch of other immune cells and immune mediators that are then activated sort of after that. Okay. So some of the, um, you know, immune cells that are involved, T cells, eosinophils, Oh, I think I spelled eosinophils wrong. Sorry. That's that's terrible. I'll I'll fix that. Let me just make sure. Um, well, don't worry about it. I'll I'll fix it. So I apologize for that. Mast cells, right? That release histamine. So histamine, cytokines, other inflammatory mediators, these are all released by these immune cells that that basically are activated. Okay. Um and if you if you look back here, right, I kind of mentioned some of these effects here. So just to clarify a little bit more on that, those inflammatory mediators that are released can actually open tight junctions between the epithelial cells and the airways um, and also affect the endothelial cells in the blood vessels, right? So this leads to things being able to get into and out of the blood vessels and also into and out of the respiratory um airways. Okay. So this is what leads to edema, increased mucus secretion, and also then bronchoconstriction. Okay. It really has to do with those immune mediators um, affecting some of the junctions between cells. Um, in later phases, you can end up with even more damage or sort of more permanent damage to the epithelial cells, um, which can lead to even more inflammation and even more mucus production, and then thus more bronchoconstriction. So again, it's this sort of... Um, amplified immune response that's happening, right? And depending on how, um, I don't know, strong that sort of immune response is, it will dictate how much damage ends up happening to those ep epithelial cells, right? And how much bronchoconstriction occurs as a result, okay? So again, if you're talking about recurrent asthma, and again, this still can be allergic asthma that just keeps happening um, over time, and you have this sort of frequent um, or this process here is happening frequently, You it leads to more permanent damage, like I said, right? Um, those smooth muscle cells can actually hypertrophy and hyper and hyperplasia can occur, right? So both the cells can get bigger and, they're be and, and more cells can be produced, okay? And if there's a larger or a thicker smooth muscle wall, that narrows the airways in general, okay? even more mucus glands will be produced, okay? And it is also possible possible that fibrosis can occur as a result as well, okay? So again, reoccurrent asthma, um, frequent sort of um, inflammatory responses that are occurring can then lead to more permanent damage and then obviously thus exasperate the symptoms that occur when an acute episode happens. Okay, so if you look here at the sort of changes in the bronchial during an asthma attack, right? You know, here's normal, and here's what's happening during an, an asthma attack. You can see that those airways are severely, severely constricted. Too much mucus, right? It says swollen mucous membrane, lots of mucus uh, um, secreted, contracted smooth muscle that basically squeezes those airways, okay? Um, in terms of clinical manifestations, chest tightness, right? Shortness of breath, wheezing, um, cough could be with or without, um, sputum. Um, and if you're talking about a severe asthma episode, you can have tachypnea and tachycardia as a result. Okay. If you want to classify asthma based on severity, you can talk about mild intermittent asthma, right? So in between episodes, there's really no symptoms. It's just that there is some sort of trigger that then induces that asthma attack, but then things kind of go back to normal in between. However, if you get more persistent or more, um, severe asthma, okay, this is then going to require the use of bronchodilators, um, 
more than two times a week and it will start to interfere with daily activities. So it's the idea that like um, things aren't really going back to normal in between an episode, okay? And maybe you don't even really have an asthma attack, but you kind of have these persistent symptoms that occur um, kind of all the time. Okay, in terms of diagnosis, right? Obviously important to get a medical history, physical exam, um, those pulmonary function tests that we talked about. You can do those both before and then after the use of a bronchodilator um, to see how, and I think I had another typo on the last slide, I apologize, um, to see how effective that bronchodilator is, right? So ima again, imagine if you have hypertrophy of that smooth muscle wall, right? And it's just bigger in general, maybe the bronchodilator isn't gonna have as much of an effect, right? Um, there also is challenge tests, tests that can be done where basically um, they can actually give you a dilute amount of a particular irritant to see if that's what's evoking the response. If you're trying to figure out what is the sort of um, trigger, okay? Also, another um, type of diagnostic test is actually assessment of exhaled, ni exhaled nitrogen oxide. So you can use this as a biomarker for inflammation and also effectiveness of treatment. Apparently, asthmatics will exhale more nitrogen oxide than controls. Okay, so that's another type of, or another way um, to sort of assess what's going on with the asthma. Treatment, environmental control. Again, if you know what the trigger is, stay away from it. Um, educating again, that patient on what the triggers might be, what are some things you can do to sort of um, lessen the severity of the symptoms, or again, avoid triggers. Um, bronchodilators, like I mentioned, uh, may be necessary, but then also you can take, you know, just a daily anti-inflammatory me medicine, right? That is often a corticosteroid um, that just decreases inflammation in general. And so usually taking the daily anti-inflammatory medications reduces the necessity to do use a bronchodilator. And so in general, using bronchodilators multiple times a week is not it's not really a good thing. And so if that dilator, bronchodilator is being used a lot, it's usually necessary to get that patient on an anti-inflammatory medication. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about COPD specifically. Okay, so as I said um, earlier in the lecture, it is a umbrella term, right? Okay, that sort of, um, it's a progressive lung disease or a characterized, right, umbrella term for progressive lung disease, diseases that are characterized by chronic bronchitis and emphysema, okay? Um, and these are not reversible changes, okay? Um, these are, I mean, COPD is linked to cigarette smoking, okay? Accounts for 90% of COPD in industrialized country countries. It's rare in non-smokers. Okay, so I mean, this is one disease where you can pretty much clearly say it's caused by smoking, okay? Now, there are some rare incidences where it could be caused by something else, maybe like in a severe industrial exposure or some sort of environmental exposure that was repeated and chronic, but for the most part, it is caused by smoking, okay? It does have a gradual onset and sort of has a sort of more slowly progressive um progressivity of symptoms, okay, and you and main symptoms, right, dyspnea and shortness of breath, okay. Again, risk factors, cigarette smoke, okay. Secondhand smoke can also contribute to it. Mm. There's also a genetic predisposition, meaning not every person who smokes develops COPD. So there's definitely some sort of, um, you know, a genetic component that might puts you at increased risk, okay? But for the most part, if you don't smoke cigarettes, you're not gonna develop COPD, okay? Like I said, there are definitely occupational exposures um, <clears throat> that could lead to this as well, or also, again, make things worse, worse, right? So if you have an environmental exposure and then you also smoke, you are, you are more susceptible to developing COPD, okay? Indoor air pollution, same thing, okay? Also, severe respiratory tract infections can put you at increased risk. But again, most of the time, you also have to add smoking into the mix. Okay. Again, ideology, right? Chronic airflow, airflow limitation, right? Air obstruction due to abnormal inflammatory response, okay? So there is an abnormal inflammatory response that is occurring as a, res you know, as a result of exposure to mostly 
cigarette smoke, okay? Um, you can grade COPD, right? Or clinicians will grade COPD um, based on severity, okay? So this gold is the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, basically to set standards to be able to diagnose this, um, this disease. So if you look at mild, right, going on to very severe, okay? So basically you can take a look at the description of the symptoms that will occur in gold one, right, or mild COPD versus severe. Okay. Once you start getting to severe, it's really going to be affecting the patient's quality of life. Um, fatigue, right? Re um, repeated exasperations. There is a lot of shortness of breath. You're not really able to do any other sort of activity, right? Because so much of that energy is going towards trying to get oxygen in. Okay. So I would say we should be familiar with these. Okay. We really should understand or be able to kind of list differences between symptoms that you would see in mild COPD versus severe, okay? All right, in terms of pathophysiology, um, it says here, airway obstruction results from fixed airways that have increased resistance, slowing the rate of airflow, okay? Um, and again, this is caused by chronic inflammation, remodeling of the lung tissue. And we're going to talk, we're, I'm going to show you pictures and really talk specifically about kind of what's going on here. Destruction of pulmonary structures. So we say in COPD that it really is sort of irreversible, okay? You will ultimately have destruction of pulmonary structures, the bronchioles, um, and or the alveoli, okay? Um, and it also then will lead to hypercapnia, right, which is an increase in retained carbon dioxide. Why? What's the main problem? The exhalation? We can't get that carbon dioxide out. I mean, obviously, um, getting air in is also an issue, but remember with these obstructive lung diseases, um, exhalation is particularly difficult, okay? Um, again, as a result of that, it leads to hyperinflation, right, meaning that there's overexpansion of the lungs because air gets trapped in there, it's harder to exhale it out. Um, all right. So if we, again, take a look at a sort of flow chart here of what's going on here. Now, I will, I did, I will say that I did add in notes here for this anti-trypsin deficiency. This is actually a um, genetic disorder, okay, that basically can result in lung or liver disease. And so um, it then leads to symptoms that are very similar here, okay? So that's what that is referring to there. Um, also, I added in some notes for, oh, core pulmonale, okay? What is that? It's basically an alteration in structure and function of the right ventricle of the heart, okay? Because you have a disorder of the respiratory system, when you talk about, you know, blood moving from the heart into the pulmonary circulation, that's going from the right ventricle, okay? And so if you have a pulmonary um, issue, it often leads to damage to that right, um, and issues with that right, to that right ventricle, okay? So again, as we said, tobacco, tobacco smoke, air pollution, these are pretty much what um, are causing and triggering this. Now, we said that COPD is characterized by both chronic bronchitis or emphysema, kind of both. Sometimes, you know, patients have more of the chronic bronchitis versus emphysema, or, and, or maybe earlier on, it's just the chronic bronch bronchitis. And then as you get into later, more severe stages, that's when you're going to get the destruction of the alveoli, okay? So these are kind of the two main things that... Um, comprise COPD um, and kind of lead to really similar um, symptoms, I guess, right? But in terms of what's actually happening pathophysiologically, it's, it's, it's different. Okay. Again, tobacco smoke, air pollution leads to breakdown of elastin in the connective tissue of the lungs. Also, this genetic disorder will lead to that as well, okay? Um, continue, inflammation, irritation, right? Chronic bronchitis, okay? What are some of the things that it leads to here? We kind of talked about this, I think, already. Um, bronchial edema. Um, and I kind of talked about, you know, again, I guess if you think back to when I was talking specifically about asthma, right, a lot of what's happening here is what we see in asthma as well, okay? Um, we will talk about bronchitis in Chapter 19 as well a little bit more, okay? But bottom line is itis is inflammation, right? So this is inflammation of the bronchi. So and that inflammation can lead to edema, right? Can lead to hypersecretion of mucus, leads to a chronic cough, and leads to bronchospasm. We talked about all that. Again, inflammatory process. 
And then again, if you have enough inflammation kind of always going on, right, you have breakdown of the connective tissue as a result, it can lead to actual damage of respiratory structures. And that's what's actually happening in emphysema, okay? Both of these things lead to airway obstruction, air trapping, right, dyspnea, and also can lead to frequent infections because things are kind of trapped there. And again, you're getting destruction of structures, um, of respiratory structures, okay? If we, again, go down here, abnormal ventilation to perfusion ratio, right? Hy hypoxemia, hypoventilation, and this core pulmonary, co core pulmonary that I mentioned in the beginning, and it's in the notes. Okay, again, in, in terms of bronchitis, right? What is bronchitis? It is inflammation of the bronchi, okay? So again, because of the excess inflammation, you can add, you can end up with scarring and thickening of the basement membranes of those respiratory airways. Remember, those, those epithelial cells can become damaged, right? And they get replaced with um, other tissue, right? And that's that scarring, okay? Increased number and size of mucus glands, okay? More mucus glands are actually made and that increases mucus production. Um, loss of support for the small area airways. Again, um, the chronic inflammation is going to lead to damage of respiratory structures, okay? Um, and if you lose the support of those small airways, again, they can't be held open and that's why they sort of collapse, especially on exhalation. Um, all right, symptoms, right? A lot of mucus, a lot of cough, okay? So if you look at bronchitis, what's happening? Again, this tons and tons of mucus that's produced, and that's what's really blocking those airway. And if you look kind of at the bronchioles here, the terminal bronchioles, right, where the alveoli are, if there's a blockage there because of this increase in mucus, it's then going to lead to a deflation of the alveoli, right? Um, that loss of sort of structure for the, those respiratory structures. Um, or the, the small airways, right? Okay. <clears throat> Did I get everything there? Yeah. Okay. So now if you talk about the emphysema part of it more specifically, okay, here you're getting damage, right? Irreversible loss of walls between the alveoli, okay? And it says with no evidence of fibrosis. So meaning there's just damage to those alveoli and they kind of are completely destroyed. If the alveoli are destroyed, there's no gas exchange that's going to be able to occur, okay? Um, so some terms here, again, that I put in um, the uh, thing in terms of parenchyma, right? What do we mean by lung parenchyma? And basically, it is, it's it's the lung, right? I mean, it's, it's basically... Um, alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles, right? These are what are affected, okay? So there is actual damage to those respiratory structures. Um, and so, and these are the gas exchanging structures, okay? You also end up with hyperinflation. We talked about that as well, okay? Um, and then a little bit more, you can classify this based on uh, where um, the damage is, okay? And so this pulmonary asini, right? Basically, these are the functional units of the lung. And I have a picture that kind of shows you what that refers to. So it's just another term of referring to essentially the bronchioles and the alveoli, okay? And so I hear, I just wrote in here, see figure on slide 33, because there's an extra picture there. Um, so if you say it's centra SNR emphysema, okay, the terminal and the respiratory bronchioles um, will be affected. In para-SNR emphysema, the entire asinus and the lower portion of the lungs mostly saying that the alveoli are also going to be affected, okay? So let me just go back here. So this is what this is what this is referring to. As you can see here in centra SNR, right, the terminal bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles are, um, you know, inflamed or inflated. They're probably, there's a lot of mucus in there, okay? So that's what's going on there. Um, but it looks like the alveoli are kind of intact, right? If you talk about parasinar now, really what's affected here are the actual alveoli. And so see how these are becoming overstretched? Over time, that damages the wall of the alveoli and they can collapse and basically degrade completely, okay? If you look at what's happening in emphysema, again, you can see there's a hyperinflated lung, um, it says here, permanent enlargement of the alveoli with destruction of the septa. So like I said, these, these alveoli become enlarged, as we're showing here, right? And eventually that hyperinflatedness basically changes the entire elasticity of the wall of that alveoli, and basically it just can completely damage it. So if you think about blowing up a balloon too many times, the integrity of the wall of that balloon becomes compromised, and that's really what's happening um, uh, with these alveoli here. And you can see there's mucus pr uh, production as well. Okay. 
So the emphysema part of it is really um, <clears throat> referring to permanent damage, right, to the bronchioles and to the alveoli. Okay, and so it says destruction of the septa. So that means the sort of the divisions between these different alveoli, and they're completely destroyed. Okay. Um, so this is the, what I was referring to on slide 33. This is just showing you, right, when we say asini or asinus, right, what are we referring to? The terminal bronchial and the alveoli. So this is basically where gas exchange is going to take place. And this is where the damage is in emphysema. Okay, um, in terms of clinical manifestations, right, again, it depends on whether um, the symptoms really are contributed to more of the chronic bronchitis or the emphysema, okay? Okay. Um, I already said, told you what this is, okay? In terms of chronic bronchitis, right, you're going to end up with a, a cough, right? And always this sort of productive cough, meaning there's um, mucus that's coming up um, when, when there is no infection, okay? Um, so if you have this productive cough for three months in two consecutive years, it, you can then end up being diagnosed with chronic bronchitis and or COPD, right? Um, you're going to get progressively worsening dyspnea with shortness of breath um, and also dyspnea on exertion, okay? Also, coughing up blood is another symptom that can result as well because now you're getting erosion of that blood vessel wall, again, due to this ongoing damage to the, the bronchioles. Um, if you're talking about specifically with the emphysema, right, again, Increased dyspnea on exertion, um, something called barrel chest, and I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, it says the respiratory muscles are partially contracted position, again, require more energy. Um, hypoxemia, you can actually end up with foot and ankle swelling. That's, that's I guess, something that's sort of characteristic of em emphysema because you cannot really move around because so much energy is being expended um, to try to get oxygen um, in, right, for that work of breathing. Um, advanced COPD, reduced capacity for gas exchange. Yeah, why? Because the alveoli and those terminal bronchioles are destroyed, okay? And it says deterioration of pulmonary function. Once enough of those alveoli are destroyed, there really is not going to be um, any pulmonary function, okay? You severely or significantly will um, lose that function. All right, so this is, this is showing you here this barrel chest, right? This hyperinflation, because basically, again, it's the exhaling that's particularly um, hard for these patients. So air gets trapped in there and it's really, you're not able to exhale it out. In terms of diagnosis, similar to what we talked about with asthma, right? Those pulmonary function tests, spirometry, uh, body plethysmography, okay? X-ray, um, in, ter in terms of management, obviously assessment, monitoring, reducing any risk factors. Um, there are Medications, if we're kind of talking about a more stable kind of form of COPD, you can treat them with medication, uh, medications like a bronchodilator, um, right? Also inhaled corticosteroids. So similar medications to what you have in asthma um, in terms of kind of their mechanism of action. <clears throat> you can use fast-acting bronchodilators, right? If there is a sort of acute exasperation where really you're having trouble getting air in and out, okay? All right, I'm going to stop here because basically the combined lecture that says chapter 19 through 21 picks up with cystic fibrosis.